My name is Moritz Hoffmann and I'm a PhD student at ETH Zurich. Snail Trail is joint work with a bunch of cool folks in the systems group at ETH. Snail Trail is a system for diagnosing latency issues in data flows. It essentially allows you to answer the question, where is the latency bottleneck in my computation? If you are running a distributed data flow application and notice that it has latency problems, you can simply go ahead and add in lightweight instrumentation to it that outputs some performance records. SnailTrail will go ahead, read those records and do all the hard work for you. It constructs an activity graph representation of those records and performs a rec ranking of activities according to the critical participation, which is a metric that we introduced. In this talk, I'll walk you through what the program activity graph are and what's the cr critical participation. We added or extended the instrumentation of some very well-known distributed streaming systems. If you're running Flink, Spark, TensorFlow, Heron, or Timely Dataflow, you can start using SnailTrail right now. In this talk, I'll present how we built SnailTrail, what challenges we encountered, and how we solved them. Let me start by positioning SnailTrail relative to its related work. In this diagram, I show some related work, and the horizontal axis here represents the instrumentation complexity, the vertical, whether it works in an online or an offline scenario. Pivot tracing, as presented in, at SOSP 2015, works in an online scenario, but it requires quite a bit of instrumentation in the application to work. So it traces requests through a distributed system, and this instrumentation has to carry the, inst the data around. Cause, doing causal profiling, also presented at SOSP 2015, on the other hand, can work with unmodified programs. It determines performance bottlenecks by repeatedly running the application and slowing down, down parts of it. This is also why it's hard to apply in an on, offline, sorry, in an online setting. Snail Trail works online and requires a minimal amount of instrumentation to work. Let me give you two motivating examples. The first example is actually a screenshot from Flink's dashboard. Here we are executing a query from the Nexmark benchmark suite. On the top part, you can see a visualization of the data flow, and on the bottom part, you can see some performance counters that Flink exposes. Let's zoom into the performance counters that we can see here. It shows the duration for how long an operator has been running, how many bytes and records it received, and how many bytes and records it produced. This might be very useful for performance debugging in some cases. However, it does not reveal any dependency information and thus is not useful for debugging latency bottlenecks. My second example is for task scheduling in Apache Spark. Spark has an architecture where a driver schedules work, distributes that to workers, they compute, and once they are finished, they report that to the driver. After all workers have finished, they, the driver will schedule a new round of work. In this sense, the driver acts as a synchronization barrier. Now looking at, this, at that diagram, it's kind of obvious that the driver is potentially a latency bottleneck. The Spark forks have figured that out as well and came up with Drizzle, a recent publication from UC Berkeley that proposes a different scheduling mechanism. Now, let's apply conventional profiling on this trace. Conventional profiling gives us a time-based breakdown of where the application spends its time. As you can see here, the blue part, which is worker processing data, is where most time is spent. A little bit of time is spent by the driver in scheduling work. So, this plot does not reveal that the driver is potentially a latency bottleneck. I'll give you a small teaser. Here we applied snail trail with its conventional pro with its critical participation metric on the same trace. And it clearly highlights that the scheduling activity performed by the driver has a is more likely to be a, a latency bottleneck. The two examples that I presented were rather simple, but the real world is more complex. On the right-hand side, you can see a visualization of a data flow that computes strongly connected components in a graph. This is implemented on timely data flow. As you can see, it contains 
a lot of operators. So a lot of distributed data flows consist of many tasks, activities, and operators which have mutual dependencies. The workload can be dynamic and the jobs tend to be long running. They can run for months or weeks. All of this means that bottlenecks are hard to identify. And bottlenecks usually don't occur isolated on a single operator. They might span, span multiple operators and also different workers, which makes it even harder to debug. Let me now show why conventional profiling can indicate wrong bottlenecks when optimizing for latency. In this diagram, I show three workers performing serialization, deserialization, and processing activities. When we apply conventional profiling here, it would highlight the activities that take up most time. So, for example, those two activities, the processing activity performed by worker one and worker three. Now, we would go ahead and optimize those activities and let's see what it looks like. There, processing time has been reduced. We can see that worker one and worker three processing is dramatically shorter as before. However, the overall execution time of that trace has not been changed at all. And that is because conventional profiling does not take dependencies into account, the messages that we can see here. However, there is a well-known technique that allows us to analyze latency bottlenecks. I'll now give you a quick review of critical path analysis. Critical path analysis can be applied on a graph. For that reason, we chose the existing program activity graph representation to be able to apply critical path analysis. A program activity graph consists of nodes and edges. Nodes represent timestamped events that indicate the start or end of a worker activity. For example, node U occurs at timestamp T on worker 2. Edges, on the other hand, represent typed activities. The edge U to V here is of type serialization, for example, and belongs to a map operator. Now I want to highlight three important facts about this programming activity graph. Firstly, activities dep express dependency information, which is crucial when applying critical path analysis. Secondly, we have special edges in there which represent waiting activities. This is when a worker doesn't have any more data to process and is idling. And a critical path never crosses one of those waiting activities. And thirdly, all workers eventually terminate. So this program activity graph captures a whole execution trace. The information inside the program activity graph allows us to answer the question of which activities delay the overall execution. So let's go ahead and apply critical, classical critical path analysis on that trace. Highlighted here, you can see all edges which are on a critical path. The critical path ends at worker three because it's the worker to terminate last. If we were to optimize that execution, we would start by looking at the activities on that critical, which are on a critical path. However, this is not quite what we want. Note that the program activity graph, as I showed it, requires a whole execution trace. So it's not suitable to be used for online scenarios. So we ask, what is the equivalent of a critical path for continuously running distributed streaming applications with potentially unbounded input? Jobs executed by distributed streaming applications usually don't have an end. They run for weeks or months, so we can't wait until they're done. Also, the program activity graph and the critical path contained inside this graph change continuously. On the other hand, Profiling information can quickly become stale if workload changes. For that reason, we came on up with online critical path analysis. As before, we are running a distributed streaming application, for example, um, Spark or TensorFlow. It consumes a stream of input data, does some processing, and produces a stream of output data. Now, while it's running, it's also outputting a stream of trace data. Snailter reads the stream and cuts it into time-based windows. Then it 
computes performance somewheres on each of those windows. And now I'll explain how we can use the program activity graph to do that. So similarly to what I showed you before, here we have a program activity graph, but it has clearly defined start and endpoints. It starts at TS and goes to TE. This means that all critical paths contained in that window have the same length. They all go from TS to TE. This also means that the number of critical paths that are contained in that window is potentially much higher. So let's try to enumerate all critical paths that are contained in one window. Here in this short window, we already have nine different critical paths. And this window really would represent a short time. In reality, there are many more activities in one window. And it's impractical to do that. We have spark traces where in a 10 second window are in the order of 10 to the 21 different critical paths. So it's not practical to enumerate all of them because we would probably run out of memory. So let's try sampling. Here we selected a random graph, a random critical path, sorry, that goes from worker two to worker three. However, it misses critical activities. So if we would sample, we wouldn't get the same accuracy as if we would see all critical paths that are in the window. However, we are not really interested in the critical path themselves. We are only interested in the information that it would give us. So what we want to do is that we want to rank activities across all critical paths to capture their relative importance. The intuition behind that is that the more critical path goes through an activity, the more critical it might be. So let's do that. Here, we are counting how many critical paths go through each edge. The blue edge in the middle has nine critical paths on it. It actually has all critical paths on it that are in this window. The ones to the left and to the right have six. The green edge, the green activity at the top, has zero critical path on it because it ends in a waiting activity. And by definition, a waiting activity is never on the critical path. Now let's use this information to explain the critical participation metric. The critical participation metric captures the fraction of an edge's time contribution across all critical paths. It's defined per activity and counts and it's the fraction of critical path that go through an edge over the total number of critical paths in a window times the edge weight, and it's normalized by the window duration. So it maps to a number between 0 and 1. We can compute this number without enumerating all critical paths. We are using a modified between a centrality algorithm, and between a centrality can be computed using Brandes' algorithm efficiently. Now let's look at snail trail in action. Remember that you're running a reference application, for example, Flink, Spark, TensorFlow, Heron, and Timely Dataflow. I walked you through how we can construct the activity graph and how we compute the critical participation in a window. Now let's look at the performance summary snail trail produces. Snail trail outputs a stream of performance summaries. And each summary is essentially a tuple. And the tuple contains an activity type, an operator, a worker, and the critical participation, amongst other information. Now we can take that information and group and pivot it in various dimensions. And here I'm going to show two of the ways we can look at the data. Firstly, I show an activity type bottleneck analysis, and afterwards an operator bottleneck analysis. If you're interested, there are more in the paper. The activity type bottleneck analysis is actually the same as I showed at the beginning. Now, now we actually do understand why Snail Trail reports the numbers it does report. So again, on the left-hand side, we see conventional profiling of Spark, where conventional profiling reports that processing takes up most time and the driver scheduling activity just takes a little bit of time. On the right-hand side, we show snail trail with its critical participation metric. The processing activity still has some critical participation, but comparing the scheduling activity in the two plots, we can clearly see that critical participation highlights 
that the scheduling activity is on a lot of critical path. So this would help to diagnose latency bottlenecks. The second analysis that I'm presenting is the operator bottleneck analysis. Here we used Apache Flink. We are executing a simple word count topology consisting of three operators. The first operator reads sentences, the second operator is a flat map which splits sentences into individual words, and the last operator counts those words. Now we deliberately under-provisioned the flat map operator to create an artificial bottleneck. Now looking at the plot, on the left hand side you can see what conventional profiling would report in that case. The time spent in processing for both operators is about the same, so it does not indicate a latency bottleneck here. On the other hand, snail trail with its critical participation on the right hand side clearly indicates that the flat map operator has a higher critical participation than the count operator, which is because it's on more critical path. One remedy here would be to increase the parallelism of the flat maps operator. Let me briefly talk about the performance of snail trail. I'm structuring it in two parts. One is the instrumentation overhead and one, the other one is the performance of snail trail itself. The instrumentation that we require usually has a low instrumentation overhead. For Spark and TensorFlow, we were able to use the nat their native instrumentation to get enough information to run snail trail on it, so we didn't have any observed overhead. For Flink and Timely, we had to add or extend instrumentation, and we encountered about a 10% overhead versus logging disabled. Snail trail itself is able to ingest a high throughput of events. For eight workers, we are able to ingest in the order of 1.2 million events per second, and can do that always online. For a sessionization workload where the source computation has 48 workers, we are able to process one second worth of input data in six milliseconds and 250 sec seconds worth of input data in less than 25 seconds. That is 100 or 10 times faster than real time. And it depends on the amount of data in, in a window and the structure of the workload. Let me briefly summarize what I talked about. I showed you why conventional profiling can be misleading and indicate incorrect bottlenecks. I introduced the critical participation metric, which allows us to rank activities according to on how many critical paths they are. And I described Snail Trail, a system to perform critical participation based summaries online. If you're interested, visit our website. And the source code for Snail Trail is available online on GitHub. Thank you. Questions? Hi. Murat Demirbaş, University at Buffalo. Uh, this is great work. So my first question is, the critical participation metric does not compose across intervals, right? So if you have a critical participation metric for this block and the next block, if you combine them, you get a different thing as bottleneck. So how do you choose the intervals? Is there heuristics for that? So the question is whether the critical participation composes across windows or if we have a heuristic to combine this information? Um, that's a good question. And in our experiments, we noticed that, in fact, it does compose a little bit, but we, like from a theoretic point of view, it does not need to. And setting the right window size is really uh, something you have to tune to figure out at runtime, essentially. It depends on the frequency of trace data that comes from the system. So it, it varies on the computation and on the system that you're looking at. Okay. Second question is, so the, uh, this is measuring the latency bottleneck. Um, what if the latency bottleneck changes uh, across executions or across deployments? And That's a good question. So the question is, what happens if the latency bottleneck actually moves around? And that can happen when the workload changes. In this case, you have to go back, use snail trail again, and set, for example, the parallelism of the source computation again. This is something that has, been, has to be done regularly anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs>
Can you comment more generally on what are limitations and avenues for future work? So we just looked at one metric for in this example. So using the program activity graph, I think we can actually do many more things, but we didn't look into that yet, so this is definitely future work. And limitations for critical participation are actually that it doesn't compose across windows. So we're always kind of, we still have a manually tuned parameter in there, which, well, yeah. It's not so nice, but yeah, it is there. Great work, thank you. Any thank other you. questions? Well then, thank the speaker again.